Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next The Promised Neverland manga review. This one is going to be for Volume 8, which is called The Forbidden Game. And uh, yeah, the chapters that we're covering here are chapter 62 to 70, Indestructible Monsters, Help, Could Have Been Me, The Secret Garden, The Forbidden Game Part 1, The Forbidden Game Part 2, That Is How It Is, Introduction and Hide and Seek. Uh, before I get into specifics here, uh, I think it's a very interesting volume. The first third is a uh, much more kind of like personal, emotional, with just uh, Ray, Emma, and the guy from the shelter, whose name we still don't know, um, just kind of interacting and you know you, them sort of impressing him with their skills, but him still wanting to kill them, and then a very interesting emotional kind of confrontation between Emma and him. Uh, leading to a slight change, but then obviously the huge kind of uh, kind of surprise of Emma being taken, and that's how the whole Goldie Pond kind of uh, arc with the kind of group of demon poachers happens, and that's the uh, second, uh, you know, the the second and third third of the book uh, is what that's about. So, um, and then once you get there, it, it's very interesting to kind of set up this arc of. Okay, you're dealing with a very specific group of demons here. They can't call for reinforcements. Um, so it's just this group. These kids don't have the same sort of tenacity that um, Emma has. But then she meets sort of the, the kids who are sort of uh, running things there. She meets Lucas and it's revealed that there is actually a kind of a long-held intention to take down this game and sort of take back Goldie Pond. So, um... It's very, very interesting what's revealed right at the end, but uh, let's get going through this. So, um, again, we start off with the idea that um, the geezer guy here, as he's called, um, I suppose, uh, I, I don't, it, it's frustrating when they don't give a character a name and then they want you to call him like Mr. or Geezer or something like that. So I'm just going to call him the guy from the shelter, pretty much. Um, so the idea here is that he's planning to kill one of Ray or Emma. So as to uh, basically allow him to return to the shelter with one of them, get rid of one of the other ones. And the dynamic here is, of course, them wanting to learn from him just by watching him, you know, survive out here. Um, but he wants to get rid of one of them and he's not particularly happy about what's going on here. So uh, a lot of the early section here is really them learning on the fly how to do things very very quickly him analyzing them and noting just how incredible that they actually are but he still is confident that they'll eventually get taken out so when they do kind of make it all the way and um, he is honestly impressed and you can tell that there's a nice dynamic beginning to form but he still is intent on killing one of them and there's a lot of little things here like it's revealed that Emma's pistol the four barrel pistol that she took can fire uh, flash bombs uh, tear gas net traps and something sonic so it was a sound based attack so it, it isn't just that she took a weapon a fancy kind of pistol she took a weapon that had more kind of uh, specific uses so um, it adds more strategy to what's going on uh, he's more concerned about the fact that they didn't really take weapons uh, that are, or none of their strategy is necessarily trying to kill or wound uh, the kind of man-eater kind of demon beasts here. They're just planning on escaping, which is like, is a good strategy, but it's not going to work in the long run. Um, so we we eventually move on, and it, 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 they get into a situation. Ray is, be, is about to be eaten by one of them. Um, <clears throat> Ray ends up actually figuring out that, oh, the way to kill these things is to shoot them right in their middle eye. That is their kind of one weakness, the one thing they can't regenerate from, is if you get them right in their kind of center eye, the one thing that's usually exposed on the demons that wear masks, that is the weakness. And so Emma takes out her bow and arrow and does manage to take out one of them. So. You can see that here on this page, her taking out that demon that was about to, you know, kill Ray, and it's it's a big kind of turn in the story now that they know how to actually take them out. They still have to be very very accurate, and for the most part, they don't end up taking out many of these other demons as they go along, um, or at least they don't focus on it. But you know, just that they've 
they've made this kind of progress. It's uh, it's in a way like the biggest thing that happens in this very early section is just them figuring it out and uh, you know the guy being fairly happy that they did this. They also begin to sort of tease a little bit more of the backstory with him as you see little bits and pieces more and more and obviously we know he was the only one that survived and you be, we begin to see sort of uh, from his perspective that like in a way he was the one who like at, wanted them to go to A0863 to find Goldie Pond and then it sort of went wrong and they all got killed and that's why he blames himself here so you can see at the start of this chapter here you know him blaming himself and that's immediately the dynamic that the, the dynamic that's going on here of he is seeing with Emma and Ray and all the kids a, a basically almost a carbon copy reprint a replay of what happened with him but in a way it's working for them so it sort of frustrates him that all of his family got killed but it's working for them and he's just trying to in a way show them that in reality they're all going to be is all going to be like him uh, eventually, um, but we see that even though they get tired on this, this on in everything that's happening, they they have to kind of sleep really small amounts on the run as they kind of are constantly getting attacked. They're barely getting any food, um, but they still manage to keep going. And he does. He's kind of surprised. You know, it's not. He wasn't expecting that they'd be like this tenacious, um, and he notes that like. When they came out this way, they were like 15 or 16, but they're only like 11 or 12, and they're kind of keeping up pretty good. So again, getting across the idea of this is the you know strength of the kids from the Gracefield farm, um, and again, it's the idea that he says those eyes full of hope are making me feel nauseous um, because of I suppose what happened to him. And again, it, it, this is all setting up you know for the the big kind of confrontation, the heart to heart that Emma's going to have with him. But uh, she has a bit of a kind of inner dialogue moment here of her questioning if she's made the best kind of choices here and going out here. Uh, was it right to leave Phil and the kids behind? You know, was it right for just her and Ray to come out? Was it right for them to let Norman do what he did um, and so on? But she decides that she's going to be the one to help him because obviously she remembers the fact that help was written on the walls all over the place back at the shelter. And this is where the big con conversation starts. And I don't want to read out the whole thing, but you know, she basically comes up to him and says, "Let's talk heart to heart." Um, and it's really emotional. You know, they both get pretty angry, uh, angry at each other. But her basically saying, "You were in pain, right?" Um, is kind of what really breaks through. Uh, she says, "You and your group were a good family too, right? Uh, and you loved your friends very much. When you lost them." You were sad, frustrated, full of hate. You suffered a lot, and for years you were alone, repeating every day in agony and despair. Um, I don't know, I can only imagine. I can't say I understand the pain you went through from losing all your friends, but I still, but still I get it. Um, and what does she say next? Um, and she just notes that we're the same right. The old you and me right now my family and your friends that's why it's tough for you to look at us so, so she understands basically what we've understood about him up to now and that she, she says you might be able to distract yourself momentarily by getting rid of us but in the end it won't change anything you'll still be suffering and that's not good so let's change that and eventually it's like how will how will the change happen he kind of questions that and she says we can survive together let's live together um, and she asked him to basically join in their plan. I'm returning to Gracefield within two years. I'm going to get the younger ones we left behind and release all the others and take everyone to the human world. You should come with us. Come to the human world. Let's go see the world your friends wanted to see. Um, and this kind of hits him a bit. He's beginning to sort of like be affected by what she's saying. Uh, she, this is where she brings up that they lost Norman along the way as well, that they have you know, suffered as well. It didn't go completely all their way, um, but that it's important to carry on their will uh, to maintain the memory of everyone that they lost or had to leave behind. Um, and this is where, again, we get, we get to, I suppose, the, the names a little bit more, the visuals of what happened, and specifically with him, 
as his friend, <clears throat> as his friends were sort of taken out and captured, they all urged him to run and kind of live and sort of be the hope going forward. So we get to see uh, Nicholas letting him do that, John letting him do that, uh, Diana, uh, Lucas, and again in in this moment where like Lucas, who becomes important later on, says this, we see it kind of uh, scribbled out there the name of this guy. So that's why we still don't know his name, even though they're sort of teasing it here. Uh, he says, only I was able to survive because of them. Thanks to them, I was able to escape that place. They let me live. I survived me alone. Uh, for what? To survive together. And he st this is where he's, he sort of doubles down on not wanting to do that. But he does say, turn back immediately. Don't go to Goldie Pond. So it, it, this is what's an interesting thing here, that his ultimate plan sort of comes out here, but he reverses on it just at the last moment. So the um, the heart-to-heart -heart has sort of worked, but before we're able to sort of get any sort of resolution, what's the new dynamic going to be like, Emma is taken. So it's this really sudden thing, right at the end of the heart-to-heart, -heart, just we cut from, you know, the, the conversation to just Emma is taken away, and it's it's that quick and we immediately cut to she's on her own own she wakes up in this like town basically uh with like windmills and there's houses and stuff like that and this is basically what goldie pond actually is but um that's what uh, is happening here so um we do eventually cut back um <clears throat> the first little bit we get here with emma is her just kind of uh Walking around the place, seeing that, you know, there are houses, you know, there's things in here. Um, she then spots another uh, human running around the place and uh, follows uh, her, who I think is eventually revealed to be. But they sort of, like, tease you on it for some reason. It's just a bit weird. Emma, when it's later revealed that her name is Violet, is like, what? You were a girl. <laughs> um, but um, it's then revealed that in the aftermath of Emma getting taken, the guy did save Ray from also getting captured. Um, and he's very, you know, sort of upset about this, you know, don't go after them or it'll take you too. Um, and he explains that he drew those uh, poachers, as he calls them here, to get as a way to get rid of them. And this is where I suppose the, the reveal begins to come out. Um, of This is how he was planning on getting rid of them from the start, that he... Uh, kind of alerted everyone and that's why he chose to shoot that demon in the first place and not kill it to make it regenerate so it would look like it was attacked and draw attention to the fact that there were uh, escapees and stuff like that and Ray is obviously said that he wants to uh, get Emma back regardless of what what things are the way they are um, but he continues to warn that no this is like an impossibility they are so dangerous you can't do it uh, I'll get you back to the shelter safely, but you can't go after her. And he, he doesn't exactly explain the full situation or anything like that, but um, that's what's kind of going on here. Um, it, it's also revealed that Emma, wake, when she wakes up, it says, uh, use your pen on her hand. So uh, it's interesting, you know, the question of, like, who, who wrote it there and so on. But, uh, yeah... She, she uses the pen, and this is where it is revealed that she's at A0863. She's at Goldie Pond. The guy confirms this, that that is what A0863 is. Um, but obviously, the idea that we basically get presented to us is that what it was meant to be versus what it is now are very different. And I suppose the situation that we don't have explained is how it got to be this way, because it is part of William Minerva's plan, but... This clearly wasn't part of it. So this was sort of something that I suppose couldn't be planned for, that poachers would set up a basically secret, uh, this secret garden of poaching basically here. And you can see here the rules there, music, monsters, survive. And the basic setup here is that when the music happens, the kids all have to, the kids that are here for the demons to hunt, all have to run away. The monsters uh, or the demons will come after them and try and hunt them for sport. Uh, they have to try and survive. When the music happens again, the hunt is over. Anyone who survived is survived, of course. They're allowed to have medical supplies and heal up. Uh, but it's going to happen again in the next couple of days. So it's this basically sort of big game sport here. It's hunting in 
the other way than like Emma learned. And uh, wh what's interesting that we get here over the course of this is that uh, wh when Emma learns about this, it sort of it insults her a little bit because she's, I suppose, learned the true way of hunting with sort of all the um, with with the the gumpa thing that. Uh, putting the flower in them to sort of, you know, you've hunted in the right way to survive and not just for sport and stuff like that. So um, it's just to see basically, basically d demons doing it just for the kind of thrill of the hunt, you know, big game poaching, that sort of thing. Um, but as we switch uh, chapters here, um, uh, we get this reveal of, a, I suppose, who the poachers actually are. And we get to see more of these, like, I suppose, intelligent demons talking about, like, uh, you know, uh, everyone, what are you looking for today? Someone says, uh, a fatty one with little muscle. Someone else says, a pale 14 or 15 year old with chestnut hair. Someone just wants to trample down some weaklings. And then, here's our main demon character here for this arc. What about you, Grand Duke uh, Luvis? Um, he says, me, my target has always been the same. A strong human who comes at me with the intent to kill. I haven't seen any around here lately though. So obviously the setup here is that Emma at this point is exactly what he's looking for. And of course the setup here is what is she going to do to eventually provoke that. And that's exactly what we get in this section here. So as she meets up with uh, Violet who is the ki kid she was following. Uh, she talks about how you know is this a farm or are the poachers here. She notes that like, oh, you are different. You know about the farms and them. So, you know, she immediately is interested in Emma, wants to keep Emma safe so she can bring Emma back to the others who are like important in this kind of situation. And so that kind of gives, I suppose, Violet's motivation of just like, this isn't just another kid. There's, you know, oh, it's like an escapee. I, I, I need to get her back to get involved in this. So this this person reveals here that this isn't a farm. This is a, this is private property, a garden, belonging to an aristocrat named Lord Bayon, who is the I suppose main guy of the poachers. Is the idea is he's organized all of this, um, and uh, he and she says all of us, including me, you, the other kids, are allowed to live here to be hunted, um, and it's a secret far. It's a secret from the farms, a secret playground. Um, and this is an interesting one by itself because what we what we learn after this is that because of that they're effectively they're doing something that's illegal even in demon society because of the whole promise thing that we got in like the last volume um they can't call for reinforcements it's just them there's a sort of thing where like if they call for reinforcements they're getting themselves in trouble in, in demon society it's it's going to be revealed that Effectively, they've been stealing kids from the farms to supply this kind of illegal poaching thing. So the one benefit that sort of is, is ends up being revealed for the rest of the volume is that if they can find some way to turn the tables, it is like 50 or so kids against, you know, I think they reveal it's five main demons and then some assistants. So like if they can take them out, they have Goldie Pond back. They've sort of reclaimed a certain area to themselves and I suppose can properly use it for what it was meant to be used for. Um, so that's interesting. Um, and she says, you know, uh, there's someone I want you to meet. So that's the whole Violet kind of setup. But um, this is where Emma then sort of jumps into action. She sees that other kids are in harm here because the hunt is going on at this point in time. Uh, we get to see this sort of family... Uh, at play here and uh, they're about to be killed by this one particular demon and they're offered the deal of choose one among the three of you who will be chased and hunted by me uh, uh, once you decide the other two can go and we see that the the bigger brother here of the situation is sort of hiding behind a tree they're sort of setting up he's sort of the the coward in a way the younger boy has been hurt the younger girl has sort of stayed to fight but uh, and is sort of done a little bit of damage but it's not looking good for them gives them a 10 second count to kind of get involved here as Louvis is sort of watching on he's not particularly happy with the way the others are going about doing their hunting and he watches on as Emma sort of storms in takes the axe from axe from the bigger brother and just you know chucks it at this demon who's uh, 
coming up with this crazy strategy. He, he steps in at the very last second, just barely stops the axe from hitting this demon right in its kind of weak point eye. And immediately knows that this is who he wants to hunt. He's found someone who went straight for the weak point, intent to kill, would have killed this other demon. And this is the immediate setup. I think it's, I think it's brilliant setup for just, here's the villain, here's like our main hero character. He now wants to hunt her. And we know she has this intent to take them out if she has to. So that's the, the big shift. And I suppose it's basically the presentation of our first proper demon villain character. He says, this is great. I can have fun for the first time in a while. I haven't felt this way since those kids. And we get a shot of um, the guy from the shelter, uh, Lucas, and, and some of the other uh basically the, the people that he lost along the way. So the idea is that they all got kind of captured on this in Goldie Pond and that's where they were all killed. And that's why um, it, it explains, I suppose, a lot of the kind of recent stuff here of like, this is a guy who I suppose, uh, you know, th the guy from the shelter is also going to want to take out uh, Luvis here. He says, I won't let you run away, you're mine to hunt. Um, and so from there, we kind of, uh, they kind of just about kind of managed to escape. Um, they meet up with the boy that they managed to save. Um, and basically it said, you know, we'll all run away separately. And that's the best way to go about it. And she gives them the advice that if you do get captured, you know, here's the best way to escape to safety is to basically go downwind so that uh, the wind won't blow the scent of your blood towards them. Tell them that the other girl is from Grace Field. You better hurry or she might get hunted by another. So she's using the fact that she knows that she is this amazing delicacy for the, the demons and is willing to let others escape on the basis of using her as bait. So uh, the characters that we get introduced to here are Theo, who's the young boy, Monica, who's the girl, and then the older brother, whose name is Jake. And um, this is a pretty emotional kind of little arc that we get here to just set up, I suppose, the stakes of this game and so on. So Emma and Violet kind of uh, end up sort of escaping together. Um, and uh, they manage to, to get to safety, uh, you know, but uh, we see that the others sort of do encounter some trouble uh, once they get back. Um, yeah, they... Yeah, they... they, they this is a section I sort of, uh, between markers in the book, uh, I skipped over a, a little bit of it here. But they eventually man managed to get back to the sort of, uh, I suppose, main village in all of this. The The music comes up, so it's ended. It's revealed that they do have, like, first aid kits so they can get proper medical treatment. Because, of course, as hunters, they would want their prey to actually be somewhat of a challenge so that's why they give them supplies to actually look after themselves as cruel as it all is there's at least you know for the most part none of them are going to be like completely you know just left not able to do anything about injuries so immediately when she gets back she wants to know what happened to theo monica and jake who obviously escaped separately to them she finds theo and it's revealed that, okay, something bad happened to Monica and Jake. What exactly happened? And what happened is that to basically get an even better hunt, he's already, like, obsessed with Emma at this point, but to make it even better, he wants Emma to come after him with the intent to kill out of revenge. So he's purposefully going to do something he wouldn't usually do, and that is, I suppose, more cruelly kill these these uh this this group of siblings here uh theo actually refuses to basically do what emma told him and basically sell her out that she's from grace field um this is when uh, jake actually steps in he kind of gets over his sort of uh, cowardly moment here but does sacrifice himself here as luvis just uh you know cuts him down uh, Monica's then kind of, uh, you know, the one that's sort of left behind a little bit. She's taken out, and yeah, we get the pretty tragic reveal here that both of them are dead, they were killed, uh, I lost my brother and my sister, and it's this really dark moment because Emma did everything that she could to give them everything they needed to be safe, 
and it hasn't worked. So again, it's sort of Emma learning, you know, that she, she can't save everyone in this situation. And especially the cut here. So of course we get uh, this page of it, the reveal basically coming out. And then you immediately cut to like, oh, I wonder what they're eating. And it's like, oh yeah, it's those, it's those characters they just killed. And it's, it's just the contrast of them eating this like fine cuisine versus the kind of human tragedy of what led to this. It's, uh, it's, pre it's pretty intense that the, the way that they do this. Um, it revealed that uh, four died today on this hunt and for everyone except Emma, they kind of just treat this as like, oh, that's about the usual, isn't it? Um, and Violet has sort of accepted the fact that, yeah, this is more or less the way it is. Um, but you did manage to save many others today, that she, that she did well. And this is where we cut back to the fact that uh, Luvis purposefully left Theo alive so that he would go back and basically inform Emma what happened. And so she would come and hunt him, which would make his hunt better. And I think that's just very interesting mot uh, motivations for this character of, you know, the, the big game hunter who wants the, the proper thrill of the hunt by having it actually be a little bit risky for himself, whereas it's sort of implied that the others, uh, the others want a little bit of a thrill. They want the, them to run away, but you get the impression Louvis is probably the only one who would honestly be happy if there was a proper fight back. Because it's it's revealed shortly after this that they have weapons. That weapons are supplied to them, but uh, for the most part, none of them know how to kill the demons, and that's the significance of Emma knowing that they have their their weak point now and so you have a little bit of a moment here of uh, Emma being depressed about everything and she can't forgive them and now she's brought to I suppose the leaders of the sort of resistance movement within uh, Goldie Pond they go into the windmill and this guy named Adam uh, lets them in and what's interesting is that he's like huge compared to everyone else uh, you can see here like so much bigger than them but uh, when you get the close-up, you can see that it's not that he's, like, old or anything like that. He's just, like, this deformed character, interestingly. And he's obviously super strong as well. Um, and this is where we meet, I suppose, some of the kind of older teenage characters here who are sort of running the show. And we get introduced to a lot of characters here. Um, we get uh, Sandy and Zach, who are the medics. Uh, Nigel, who's in charge of gadgets. Uh, Sonia is the sub-leader. Uh, Pepe, uh, Jillian, Paula, who are in charge of food. Her, she reveals her name is Violet, which is also sort of surprise reveal that she's actually a girl. And then Oliver is the leader. So nine in total, and they're the ones that are in charge. That they survived the hunting on the ground for months, and some of us for years. Uh, she introduces herself as being from Grace Field. They reveal that they're all from Grand Valley, uh, a farm that is a purveyor to Lord Bayon. So the idea is that him being the sort of, uh, you know, uh, lord in this situation um, has some sort of a deal with this farm where he's able to get some kids to supply his, you know, personal uh, need here for this hunting. So um, that explains why they're all from a specific farm. They do reveal that there are some kids that are from another farm. I think they specify at some point that there are three who are not from the... Uh, the, what was it again? Not from Grand Valley. Um, and yeah, they, they, this is where they reveal that they have the weapons and that their intent is to shut down the hunting ground and that they'll kill all of them. But obviously the, the idea is that it's been months, it's been years, they haven't quite managed to formulate a plan just yet to make that happen. Um, and uh, yeah, they say that because it's the secret hunting ground, the enemies are limited. The monsters outside don't know about this place and they can't know, so the poachers won't call for reinforcements and even if the others notice, we can buy time. We plan to kill the poachers and escape to a human community. Um, and this is when she is then brought to meet, I suppose, the overall leader of all of this. The guy who's sort of been a secret, but because she knows so much, she is going to be introduced to him. And this is where we get the reveal that Lucas is still alive. So uh, they they reveal it properly afterwards. But if you've made the connection already of 
Lucas, Lucas, they just showed us in the flashback as being the guy from the shelters, uh, one of his friends who was supposedly sacrificed. Uh, Emma connects it immediately, the name Lucas was on the wall. And he says, let's talk about William Minerva. And so they have their talk. Um, and here uh, she, she asks the question. She wants to make the connection immediately. Are you from Glory Bell? Did you come from B0632? And do you know someone? Um, and she, he recognizes the clothes from that place. And he says that he was scared to ask it. It's been 13 years already. Is he alive? And she nods. And it's a very emotional moment, as in tears, he says, oh my gosh, thank goodness, thank goodness. So, very emotional reveal here, just connecting the dots that, oh, here is suddenly a reason for him to have some hope. That everyone didn't die, there's at least one other survivor. Um, so, that will be a very emotional thing for him when it happens. So... She's like, oh, I'm so glad he'll be so happy. He thinks you're dead. He thinks he lost all of his friends. Lucas says, I was the only one who survived. Even I thought I was done back then. Um, and he wanted... Uh, um, he, he wanted, basically, the, the guy to be the uh, beacon of hope um, as he survived. We also see that uh, uh, Luvis was kind of present there. So he is responsible for a lot of what happened. And again, the sort of personal connection of him to things becomes all the more sort of uh, prevalent here. He, he was, he's revealed that he was actually saved by uh, this girl um, who said that she's been hiding the whole time so the monsters wouldn't find her. She'd been playing hide and seek the whole time at a place they'd never find her. They were never d discovered. She helped hide me. And that she died about five years after... Uh, she saved him, she got sick, um, and it's been eight years since then. So there's sort of a mystery about that, is like, is there a significance to that? Who was that character? Um, and so on. Um, and it's just revealed that he also wants to destroy the hunting grounds. He'll never forgive these poachers. So he says he gathered the kids who felt the same way, taught them skills, gave them information, helped them prepare. He needed to destroy this place, uh, and he says that I found it, it was here at A0863, the reason Mr. Minerva invited us, the place where she hid me uh, in the beginning. And we go to this secret area, they go even further down, and that there's a door, a door that was locked, and that the reason he was unable to open it is because he didn't have a pen. Emma has the pen, they can now go inside, and that's the sort of cliffhanger ending on this side of the story, is that... Finally, after all these years, he is going to find out what's inside, and Emma is also going to potentially further the mystery of uh, William Minerva to find out what is what he really intended for everyone. We then cut back to Ray and the guy from the shelter, and uh, they get they also get to uh, A0863, Goldie Pond, but they're on the top, and it's revealed that Goldie Pond is uh, underground. It's a uh, it's below the surface, so it, that kind of begs the question, like... Like, it, it's hard because it's obviously black and white manga to get across the idea that a place that looks the exact same... Uh, well, a place that looks the exact same as basically being out in the open is actually underground, and, like, is the lighting different or what? But that's the, the setup that we have here. Uh, and so they have to sneak in, and that they're confirming that they are going to go inside. So he says, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we go in, it's going to be hell. There's, there's uh, no guarantee we'll make it out alive, but let's do it. Let's go inside Goldie Pond. So this is an interesting one. I suppose the heart to heart from Emma worked for him. He's going to try and get her back after, I suppose realizing it was kind of a mistake to, to lead them into this trap. But there's the setup now that he's going to go there. He's probably going to get to meet Lucas. He may be able to get his revenge on uh, Luvis uh, and take back Goldie Pond. He may regain hope in Minerva. It, it's going to be a big one, and I, I think it's it's a it's a great volume for the guy from the shelter. Um, again, I I think it would be best sooner rather than later to give him a name, just so it's it's easy to refer to him. But um, I think you know a solid solid volume. Again, it's it's sort of that sort of transition point of it was the start of I suppose another arc here. But I think there was enough good stuff here that it uh, ended up being very very entertaining. Um, 
Next volume, I think, if I remember correctly, because uh, I did read it, um, is very impactful. I remember really, really enjoying Volume 9, so when we cover that next week, it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, the only thing I will say is that uh, Volume 9 is out a uh, physical copy. Um, I read the dig digital, digital copy already. Um, I've ordered Volume 9, but it hasn't shipped yet for some reason, and it's been like a week or two since release, so... Um, We'll have to see if I if I have the physical copy or not. If not, I may be switching over to going digital. I know I'll have to do that at some point because there's no way um, the the schedule I want to do for this re uh, read through is going to be able to follow the the official English releases of the physical copies because uh, there there's usually th like three or four months or something like that. It, there's, there's usually a good amount of time between volumes. Um, so yeah, that's my thoughts on uh, Volume 8, The Forbidden Game. In the comments let me know what your thoughts were, but uh, that's been the video. Thanks for watching, and bye.